Hi, it's Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to be looking at the subject called Wounds of a Friend. And it comes from a couple of different passages, one of which is in Galatians chapter 4 and in verse 16. So if you've got a Bible, I'd invite you to turn there. We're going to look at that in just a moment. You know, sometimes the things I say uh, don't always set well with people. I say things sometimes that people don't like. I, uh, it may be that they've never heard what it is that I've said before and are not quite sure how to take it. One of those things is uh, the questions I get about God's name, Yahweh. I use that a lot when I'm reading from the Old Testament. Whenever I see the word Lord in all capital letters, well, it's a reminder to me that that's actually the name of God, Yahweh. And so I say that. And some folks hadn't heard that before, and so I got a lot of questions about it. Another thing is that sometimes people get angry when their toes are stepped on. Sometimes when I'm having a personal study with somebody on salvation and we get to some of the requirements of salvation, things that they've never heard before, and they take offense to them because it's not what they were taught. Uh, maybe I'll be talking to somebody about their own faithfulness and how they need to be more faithful to the Lord. And immediately their defenses rise and and they get a little standoffish about that. I get that. Nobody likes to be told that they're doing wrong. Uh, it's not that they don't have a reply. In fact, usually they don't, really. But folks get mad. They get angry when they're told something that they don't want to hear. In the letter to the Galatians, Paul had written to them to root out elements of error, certain erroneous doctrines that they were that they were believing. And in order to do that, he had to use frank, blunt language. And the reason is clear. It's because their salvation was being threatened. This was important. And so Paul had to use the most direct language possible for them to realize that they were barking up the wrong tree. And because of that, some had taken offense to Paul. And he asked the question in verse 16 of chapter 4, So have I become your enemy? By telling you the truth, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. Paul is saying, there are some people who are trying to butter you up, who want you to seek them, who, who want your friendship, but only so that they can pervert your way of thinking. And so Paul says, I'm standing up to that by telling you frankly what the truth is. And so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Of course, the answer is no. If anything, Paul, you're my best friend for caring enough about me to stand up to what's wrong and tell me what's right, even willing to step on my toes to do it. How would we respond to that? How would you respond? to such a stern rebuke? Would you get mad? Would you get angry? Would you turn away from that person? Or would you repent and do the humble thing and do what's right? You see, the fact is, sometimes the truth hurts. But who is it that's brave enough to tell you the truth on such a personal and important matter as salvation? I'll tell you who. A trusted friend. Somebody who cares. Proverbs 27 verses 5 and 6 say, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. The, the, the proverb writer is reminding us that it's better for somebody to, to wound you in love than to butter you up and slather kisses on you when it's false and wrong. Proverbs has a lot to say about rebuke, mostly about being open to rebuke. And he tells us here, when it's plain to you, you should appreciate that more. See, someone who doesn't care enough about you to tell you what's right isn't going to care about telling you the truth about that thing. Proverbs 29 verse 5 says, A man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. And sometimes that's all we want. We want people to agree with us, to flatter us, to accept us, to tolerate us, not tell us what's wrong with us. But who is it that shows real love? The person that does the hard thing and confronts someone in sin? Or the person that just lets it go, letting that other person believe it's okay? We shouldn't for a moment think that 
we're going to escape the scrutiny of God when we miss out on our obligation to tell someone else about the right thing, the right way, when we have that opportunity. As a preacher, it's not only my job, it's my obligation to God to say to those who hear me what's needed, even when it hurts. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul told his protege Timothy about this very thing and, and how he needed to be prepared to do it all the time. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, Paul says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Now, Paul could have been speaking straight to the church-going public of the 21st century. That's what we want. We want feel-good preachers, and the proliferation of such feel-good preachers across our, our airwaves are, are proof of that. But Paul told Timothy, you need to say what's true, what's right. Be ready to do it all the time. Now we're told in Ephesians chapter 4 that we should speak the truth in love, and I'll always endeavor to do that. But I also hope that no matter how it comes out, if it's true, I would hope that people would respond rightly. We should recognize that while sometimes the truth hurts, well, because of that, sometimes the truth also divides. See, the easiest thing to do when you hear something you don't like is to avoid the messenger. How many times have you seen on Facebook or heard somebody say, I'm done with negative people? They don't want to hear anything negative. They don't want to hear anything that condemns them. And so they would just as soon avoid those people altogether. Cut them out of their lives. Well, that kind of attitude has been around for a long time. Ahab the, the king hated Micaiah the prophet for that very reason. In 1 Kings chapter 22, go there with me. 1 Kings chapter 22. In 1 Kings 22, there was a war about to happen. And Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And he had a bunch of yes men around him who assured him, yeah, things are going to be fine, things are going to be fine. But Jehoshaphat, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, wanted to know, wait a minute, wait a minute, isn't there a real prophet here, somebody who can speak on behalf of God? And so we're told in verse 8 of 1 Kings 22 that the king of Israel, Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, well, yeah, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of Yahweh, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me but evil. He's Micaiah, son of Imlah. Jehoshaphat said, No, let not the king say so. In other words, don't say you hate him because he speaks for God. Well, they called for Micaiah. Micaiah said, God says you're not going to be successful in this. And Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat and says, See, what did I tell you? He never tells me anything I want to hear. Well, that's an age-old problem, isn't it? In the New Testament, Felix kept Paul at bay because Paul said things that he didn't want to hear. In Acts chapter 24, go there with me. In Acts chapter 24, we're told about how when Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea, he would occasionally have the opportunity to speak to those in power. In verse 24, it says, Some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, we'll stop there for just a moment. We can notice some things that are implied to us. Felix probably hadn't heard all that much about Jesus. And, of course, that was Paul's favorite subject. He wanted to talk about it more and more. And so, Felix's curiosity is piqued, and so he sends for Paul. Verse 25 says, But as Paul was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, all these things that spoke to the very heart of not only Felix's behavior, 
but his very motivations. It says, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. When I find time, I'll summon you. He didn't want to hear what Paul had to say. It says in verse 27 that after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. Better to leave him in a hole than let him out and maybe I have to hear what he says again. John the baptizer suffered the ultimate division, the dividing of his head from his body for the sin of speaking truth to power when he renounced Herod and his adulterous marriage to the woman he was with. In Matthew chapter 14, go there with me. In Matthew chapter 14, begin with me in verse 4. Matthew chapter 14 and in verse 4, we read that John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And so in verse 10, says that Herod sent and had John beheaded in the prison. Now here's the deal. If you don't want conflict, if you want to avoid it altogether, then just simply condone every behavior, swallow every opinion, and don't make waves. Above all, don't tell anybody that they're wrong, especially religiously. Because if you speak the truth, somebody is going to be offended. Why? Well, because their sin is exposed, and they'd rather it not be. They don't like that. Jesus spoke about that in John chapter 3. Go there with me. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, Jesus says, beginning in verse 19, John 3 and in verse 19, Jesus said, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Have you ever turned over a, a rotting log or a, a piece of wood that's been on the ground for a while? You lift it up and those little creatures, they scurry away from the light. They run everywhere. Try back to, They try to go under a dark place again so that they can hide. Well, like them, like those little creatures scurrying for the cover of darkness... A lot of people would rather stay in the darkness of their sin and disobedience than be brought to the light of the truth. Why? Because it's easier to just go along and do what you've always done, even if it is wrong, than to make the painful adjustments in your life that are needed to stand in the light. A lot of people are like the, the people of Isaiah's time. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. All the way back in the Old Testament, Isaiah spoke of people who were just like the people in the 21st century. Isaiah chapter 30. In verse 1, God says through the prophet, Woe to the rebellious children who execute, who execute a plan, but not mine, and make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. Look at verse 9. It says, For this is a rebellious people, false sons, Sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of Yahweh, who say to the seers, You must not see visions. And to the prophets, You must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. And like those we read about in First Timothy chapter, sorry, Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, we should recognize that there are people around just like that today. People who would rather hear lies because they're easier to hear. Tell me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. Because if you don't, I'll just cut you out. Well, in spite of the fact that sometimes the truth hurts, and sometimes the truth will divide, always we should recognize that the truth helps. Tolerance and permissiveness may make you feel better, but only truth and responding to it, especially responding to it, is the only thing that's going to be able to help you. Why? Because only truth sanctifies. In John chapter 17 and in verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Speaking of God's revelation. And because of that, only the truth will set you free. In John 8 and verse 32, Jesus says, if you continue in my word. Now, we should stop there for just a moment and concentrate just for a, 
um, a, a second. On this word, if, Jesus is making a clear delineation of those who will and those who won't. If and only if, unless, he says, you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The implication that Jesus gives is if you're going to listen, you better do it if you really want to be free, because only the truth will save. 1 Timothy chapter two verses chapter two verses three and four say, "This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth." See, the bottom line is this: God is going to deal firmly with those who have heard the truth, have had the opportunity to respond rightly to the truth, but made the wrong choice because they didn't like it. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go there together. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 10, Paul the Apostle speaks of those who have been duped. He says, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they'll believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Now, we should understand what that does not mean. It does not mean that God is, is going to somehow take over your mind and, and make you believe a lie. What it does say is that, well, if you just decide you're going to disregard the truth, God is going to say, fine, have it your way. But be prepared for the consequences. Truly the wounds of a friend are better than the, the kisses of an enemy. When the enemy doesn't care about your salvation. He just wants to make you feel better. Well, now it's time for some friendly wounds. This is the truth that some folks need to hear. And I'm going to prepare you right now. I may say some things that if they apply to you, may make you angry. That's not my hope. My hope is that you'll hear with an open heart and an open mind about the things that we're going to discuss in the next few minutes and respond to them rightly. The truth is, is that some people just need to come back to church. The truth on the matter is spoken to us in Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, if you'll go there with me and begin with me in verse 24, we're told that we should consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now we can stop right there for a moment and, and recognize that there's a, there's a way to do that. Wishful thinking is not the way. And sitting around your own home and, and hoping that someone else is getting along okay is not the way to do it. He says, this is how we do it, by not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. Now that's the truth, because it comes from God's own word. There may have been a reason for not going to church in the recent past because of the restrictions that have been placed upon us and the suspending of assemblies all over the country, all over the world, in fact. But that's over. Churches are up and running now, and people are going, going back, but not everybody has. And I get that there are some who are particularly vulnerable to the, the virus that has proven to be probably less of an epidemic than a lot of people thought it was going to be. And, and that's good. But the fact is, it's time for some to just step up to their obligation. To put the Lord and your obligation to Him first. And get back to worshiping Him. And you need to maybe put your obligation to God above your political opinions. I get that masks have become a hot potato recently. And I don't like masks. I've made no secret about that. I've got concerns about how 
uh, effective masks are in halting the, the spread of, of virus. In fact, there are lots of studies that tell us that masks are hugely ineffective for doing that, as well as there are proponents of masks to do that. Well, truth speaks to that in at least two ways. One truth is that we need to recognize that there are authorities who hopefully are acting in our best interests to keep us safe. And we need to respond to those authorities. In Romans chapter 13, in Romans chapter 13, in that famous passage that Paul wrote concerning government, he said in verse 1 that every person, who is that? That's you and me. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now, no one likes wearing masks, but you do, don't you? When you go to the store, because it's the law that you wear a mask in a public place, you do it. And there are some who haven't come back to God, or haven't come back to worship assembly because they absolutely refuse to do it in a church building that's inconsistent at best and sinful at worst but masks aren't required in churches at least not in the state in which I live they're highly requested but they're not mandated so is there another truth that speaks to that? Well, yes, there is. In Romans chapter 14 and in verse 13, we're told not to judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. In chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. As I said before, there are a lot of questions about the effectiveness of masks. But in the end, I've got to ask myself this question. What will I think of first? Will I think of myself and my political opinions and my opposition to those who I think are absolutely wrong on this matter? Or will I think of my brethren? Because there are some brethren who have very deep feelings about the effectiveness of masks. And it makes them feel better when folks wear them in their presence. So what does it cost me to wear a mask? A little bit of humility, maybe? some love and concern for my brethren? Really, masks are a matter of liberty, which Romans 14 and 15 is, is, is all about. Liberties which are entirely within the realm of local elderships to speak to. And our elders, where I work and worship, have spoken to it. And although I may disagree on the effectiveness of wearing masks because it's requested of me and because it makes some of my brethren feel better. Yeah, I'll do it. You can make a statement when you refuse to worship because of a piece of cloth. But I'd rather make the statement that lives up to my responsibility to God and shows love and concern and care for my brethren. Because the bottom line, or maybe a bottom line, is that sometimes you just need to put your brethren before yourself. That's what we've been reading, right? Verse 2 of Romans 15, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good. Before that, and not just please ourselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul isn't necessarily speaking in 1 Corinthians 9 about brethren but he does talk about considering other people and doing whatever you can to accommodate those people so that your 
influence with them can be best served. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 19, Paul said, Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who were under the law, as under the law, though not being under the law, so that I might win those who were under the law. To those who were without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who were without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I might, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. For me, verse 23 says it all. I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Does that describe your behavior? Does that describe your refusal to come back to worship? You see, the whole of Christian life is all about making accommodations without compromising the truth. Why? So that our witness before others, so that the testimony that we offer to others, so that the influence we hope to wield with others is not mitigated by our own stubbornness. So, now, you've heard the truth. What will you do with it? As Paul asked, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? I hope not. The purpose of the truth is to steer us right, to make us do better, to bring us closer to God and to one another. So have you obeyed the truth? Unless you turn from your sin, and unless you are immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and unless you live a life that is faithful to God, you won't see heaven. That's the truth. Unless you recognize your obligation to God, and put it first, nothing else matters. Have you obeyed the truth? I hope I'm not your enemy. I hope I'm your friend. And I hope you'll listen to what's been said. Thank you. God bless you.